be able you know, to ask questions, to speak up concerning the things that we're talking about. So each evening at 6 o'clock, the concept is from the book of Genesis about redigging the wells. And what we want to do, we're going to look at that passage, we're going to emphasize that teaching, and then we're going to consistently apply the concept of rediscovering God's truth on a topic each night. So it's going to be the organization of the church one night, personal work one night, and benevolence slash edification that's our Bible class and so forth the third night. So we're going to look at each one individually, what the Bible has to say about how that should be. But then we're also going to look at the practical aspects to figure out what we can do practically to build up and advance the congregation here. And for those that are watching maybe live or recorded later on from the meeting, you can apply this to the congregation where you are at. Mm -hmm. Because these same truths are going to apply across the board. And the reason that is is because Paul said he taught the same thing in every church, 1 Corinthians 4 and 17. So before we begin this evening, Brother Rob, would you just pray? Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thy glorious name. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for this beautiful day that we've had to enjoy. We're so thankful for this opportunity we had to gather together to study your word, to consider your greatness, to consider our weakness, our needs. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless Brant as he makes the effort to encourage us and to teach us what we need to know so it might be pleasing to thee. Heavenly Father, we know that we often fail thee. We pray that you'll help us to overcome our temptations. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us to set the right example before those that we come in contact with. We do everything we can to spread the gospel. We're so thankful to the brethren here who had the insight to have this meeting and to encourage us so thankful, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, for our Lord and Savior, for his willingness to do the things that had to be done in order for us to have hope of heaven. We pray help us to always bring glory and honor to his name. Bless us this hour. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So, again, we're going to look at briefly the text from Genesis. If you have your Old Testament, it's turn to Genesis, the 26th chapter and verse number 18. And, of course, we know that many times, you know, when I was growing up, I used to hear all the time men in the congregation that when they prayed, they would say, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And rightly so, because that is the lineage of which we mentioned last evening, that Jesus Christ flows through. So they are profound characters in the Old Testament, and one ought to be very familiar with those three names. Genesis 26, 18, and Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. I have several points I want to make upon this, and then we'll apply it each evening. Tonight we'll meet the organization of the church. What I want to point out is, is that it is of utmost importance for each generation to rediscover and redig the wells of truth. Mm, now, in good. this text, it's talking about a physical water. But we know that Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus said that every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is what we need to live by. We cannot live by bread alone. Jesus told the woman, remember? You drink of the water that I give, you will never thirst again. So Isaac had to dig again these wells because after Abraham's death, the Philistines stopped up the wells. Now, it's not going to be long, and we don't we're not gloat these things, it's just natural attrition. It won't be long that some of us in this room will not be here. Amen. It'll be up to the next generation. Man. Come along and to redig and to discover the wells. That's why it is, again, of the highest importance that we take these interactive times to make sure that each generation is successively passing the torch of truth so that long when we're held in the sod of this earth and we pass from this life, 
that the church of our Lord in this geographical area is alive and well. Mm -hmm. yes. Now the church of Jesus universally, the church of Christ, it's never going, it's never going to be overtaken because Jesus said the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But in an area, in one geographical area, it can shrivel or it can die out if we don't proactively engage. So Amen. now I'm going to make a few points. Number one, Isaac digged again the wells of water. Are you redigging? And listen, I didn't say digging a new well. I didn't say going out here and drinking out of somebody else's well, right. denominationalism. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, are you redigging and rediscovering God's truth? Amen. For you and your home. Mm -hmm. And for the congregation where you reside. If every congregation in Clay County would take the time to redig and rediscover the wells of truth, there would be a revival in the area, the likes of which has not occurred in many decades. Which, look at the second point, which they did in the days of Abraham. Abraham initially had these dug under his supervision, under his oversight. And it seems as though that they had allowed these wells to go but after his death, things change. The Philistines look at things differently. You'll be tested mm. by Satan. It's just like the President of the United States. Let something happen. I don't care who the President is. If a President is sick or dies, other superpowers will test Amen. the new guy. Yeah. That's just how it is. Amen. Right? Yep. Somebody, I mean, even the secular world, if there's some guy peddling drugs in an area, and he dies, then somebody else is going to start swapping their wings, right? Somebody else is going to start trying to claim that territory. So you have to realize in the battle of good and evil, when someone strong in the Lord passes, an elder, a preacher, when someone passes, if someone's not there to, to step up, then the Philistines, which today by implication would be Satan and his antagonistic forces are going to come and test the new leadership. Amen. So mm -hmm. the youth have to prepare. Mm -hmm. And look at this. Had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names by the names after which his father had called them. You know, there used to be a slogan. I mean, the slogan still exists, but we don't hear it as much as we ought to. Remember that slogan? We speak where the Bible speaks. And we are silent. Where the Bible is silent. silent. Now that slogan is not merely uh, some slogan that conveyed from the lips of men. That's lifted from 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Uh -huh. Colossians 3 and 17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father by and through him. That what we do in religion is we're drinking out of the well that God has supplied. Right. And then it was a well that contained a casing, a rock, that ultimately supplied water physically. But now we're talking about spiritual water. We're talking about the food of God. So now I want to take that concept each night, and now I want to apply it to organization. How are we going to rediscover organization of the church in the 21st century when we rediscover what God said in the New Testament, what does that mean for every local congregation of the churches of Christ? I'm sorry. Now it's interactive. Say it one more time. Okay. Concerning leadership or the organization of the church, when we, when we redig these wells as we look into God's Word, what are we going to find concerning the local organization of every church of Christ? True, brother. Elders, elders, deacons, plurality, speaking the same thing, a harmony, like-mindedness, 1 like Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, that we be of the same mind and of the same judgment, that we be perfectly joined together. Now, the only way that can happen is if we have strong teaching. Amen. And there has to be a teaching strong enough that does at least two things. It exalts truth that's rediscovered and redone from the well of God's truth alone. Secondly, it is so clear that anything that is close to the truth 
but it's not 100% the truth, is known as what? False. false, false. Error or false. Mm -hmm. See, something can be close, mm -hmm. but still not right. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things that Brother Scott mentioned, it's good to see you tonight. Amen. I'm glad to see you. Yes. Amen. And Brother Scott's had a long battle with cancer. Amen. And the fact that he chose to be here tonight, that says a lot about him. You, yes. know, you just can't give up a lot. It's, it's, it's hard to press through sometimes, but I'm glad to see you here. And don't be crying on me because I'll start crying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when we're talking about, he mentioned the word plurality. That's right. Can you imagine when we rediscover this well? And some of these things, we know these to be true. But when we rediscover them tonight, we're going to talk about them. I want us to now look at the purpose behind the teaching. Not just the fact that there were bishops, and that's just another word for elders. Mm -hmm. just, not just that there was a plurality in every <clears throat> church. Acts 14, 23, Philippians 1, 1. But why? Why is there a plurality of elders in every church? Well, first of all, what are the elders doing? Overseeing. Shepherding. 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 Overseeing. They're legislating in matters of options or in judgment. They're making decisions in areas where, where you know, God, the doctrine of the New Testament, right, for the congregation of the church is, is the New Testament. But God allows elders to help legislate and make decisions where there is not an exact mm -hmm. uh, book, chapter, verse for that. Right? Yeah. It's areas of judgment. In other words, uh, how many uh, missionaries are we going to support? Mm -hmm. Or maybe are we going uh, to move in a direction, maybe of uh, putting an additional person on uh, to win souls for Christ as evangelists? You know, those types of things. Yeah. And, and also when we're looking at souls, about maybe, maybe we've got to call so-and-so in uh, and talk to them or go visit them, the elders, and talk to them about their soul or maybe even their marriage that we see as weak. So there are decisions to be made in matters of judgment. And so since those are very serious decisions, and they guide the flock, Hebrews 13, 17, now you see the wisdom of why God does not allow one man to occupy the decision. Yes. Because it, it could be very easy, could it not, for one man to become a dictator, one man to become biased, or maybe just even his own family become weakened and make decisions for a congregation that truly is not in their best interest. His judgment could be impaired. Yeah. But when there's a plurality of men, the likelihood of that happen is slim to none. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God in his infinite wisdom, I just want people to see that there is a purpose behind God's teachings. Mm -hmm. These are not arbitrary teachings that men have tried to, through tradition, bind people to. God set these up for a purposeful reason. And so elders are wise, they're qualified, and one of these qualifications, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, is that they're not a novice. Mm -hmm. They're not young in the faith. That they're not young. They, they've had life's experience, which gives them not only the word of God, but the wisdom, beyond that knowledge that goes with it, right, the heavenly wisdom that allows them to make decisions that are going to best benefit the flock at large over which they oversee. I'm sorry, Brother Stubb, but I, I've got to say this. You know, and I've been to several churches of Christ in the, around the world as a whole, and Brother Pete God, so I think my favorite verse in the Bible, I carry one in John 8, 32, and I've seen so many churches of Christ in my little small 10 and a half years as they're afraid to stand on the truth because they think they're going to hurt somebody's feeling. That's why a lot of them like me because I got a lot of people in my family that are Baptists and Pentecostals. When I live at home, they're coming up. But I got to tell you the truth in case Jesus comes at that moment been ex minister. You got to be bold and have backbone on the truth. Do the homily without doing that, get mad through Christ. You got to let the other denomination know it ain't for one because that means Brother Pitcock talk about a lot of them. Don't believe in taking the Lord's Supper, Acts 27, up on the first day of the week. They said it, it ain't important, but like right. he told them. But they make it important to pass the command. So it all goes to the truth. You got to do it. That would be the first day. It's some church Christ people I see, they're afraid to tell other number nations the truth not be around. I don't say to my big mouth, and it's hard when you got a big mouth. I just give them a look. And I tell them, honey, we got to do what Christ do with the truth, because he said, I forgot where it says in the Corinthians, 
the truth will stand when the world don't block the church. That's what we're going to get judged by is the truth. Mm. Amen. I mean, and that's why we're rediscovering the wealth this week. Yes. And what we need, you know, it's going to be difficult yes. to win the world for Christ when the churches of Christ are not fully committed to redigging the wells. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just here. We have to figure out a way practically. That's part of the reason we're discussing this tonight, interactively. How are we going <coughs> to take these messages? And one of the ways we can do that. Like the brother, give you last name again. Me. Me. He's got me. map of South like everybody else. Okay. Boss. <laughs> brother Me. Yes, sir. See, we need to be able to teach and to hold hands with all the congregation, the Church of Christ, and those that are not practicing what is true, they need to be brought back with correction to the truth. Yeah. Man. So if you have any contacts, yes. okay, that we can go and teach and preach and hold. Then you give it there and let's go. Amen. Because mm -hmm. that's what we've got to do. Yes. And we need to be kind in our disposition. We need to be firm in the scripture. But firmness, you can't get around the truth. Nope. Yeah. That's what we do have to have. Amen. And Say if we have the truth, then everything else eventually is going to start falling into place. Amen. We need to get excited about it. Do you have something wrong? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, the Greek word for presbytery is what? Anybody remember? That's right. Presbyteros. That's where the Presbyterians lift their name. The Presbyterians are correct on this one point. That the presbytery ought to consist of more than one element. They were right on that point. They still are. They're wrong in other areas, but they are right on the presbytery. They believe that elders must be multiple or plural. First Timothy 4.14. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make sure. So the Bible says there that the presbytery, and we're talking about the body of men who serve in a local congregation, who exercise authority in matters of judgment and watch on behalf of souls. Mm -hmm. And that body of men is a functioning body that acts by consensus and not by vote. Now, I want to bring that up tonight. If we're hmm. rediscovering the whale, Brother Pitcock, yes, right? sir. Yes, sir. it's not enough to merely point out the plurality of this body, but it's also important to point out how it is that they oversee and superintend the flock over which the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter 20, has made them the overseers. By the way, you know how the Holy Ghost makes men the overseers? The word. <laughs> By the qualifications that he has laid down. Yes. Amen. The Holy Spirit gave us the word of God. Amen. So the Holy Spirit makes elders, Acts chapter 20. Mm -hmm. He makes them by the qualifications. Okay, so we look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, this idea of the presbytery. So how is this presbytery? Let's, let's say you have a congregation of a fairly large one. Maybe you have four, five, six, seven elders. Some say, now listen, this is, I said some say. Mm. I didn't say the Bible says. Amen. Some say, you have to have an odd number of elders. <laughs> no. Why do they say that? Like the Supreme Court. Like the Amen. Court. Like yes. the Supreme Court. Yes. Like the Supreme Court. Amen. Because if, if there's a disagreement, some say you have to have an odd number. We're just getting started, so just come right on in. Mm -hmm. And just so you'll know, this class is interacting, and the 7 o'clock hour is preaching. So we're discussing elderships and organizations the local congregation, mm -hmm. redigging the wells. We've, we've discussed the fact that we know that elders, uh, the presbytery in 1 Timothy 4, 14, it's a plural body of men. So now what we're discussing is the reality, the practical aspects. So an eldership would say, someone says, well, you have to have, you have to have an odd number. And they say that because why? <laughs> because it's assuming a vote. Yeah. Yes. And the reality is this body of men, through all of my study of the Testament, the idea is consensus, there is study, and there is prayer. In matters of doctrine, it's already decided. In matters of judgment, yes. they should work together and form a consensus. Could you imagine? Seven men as elders. And they take a vote. Four yay, and four, excuse me, three nays. Yeah. 
Well, what you have now is much like politics. Yes. Yeah. You have division. Yes. So elders do not serve in, in the idea of voting as consensus. And I think, oh. I'm sorry. Jason I, and then Eric. Okay. And then Jim. I, I was just going to say we're so blessed to have that already in order for us that we don't have to rely on votes. Amen. Amen. I don't know if that's what you're saying. Yes, yes. And, that, and that's what the confusion, confusion is in some places. They believe in the presbytery. They believe in the male occupying that role of the New Testament teacher, the husband and one wife. They believe the qualifications for three Titus one. But but the problem, the struggle is in the practical carrying it out. They assume that either you have to have an odd number, or they assume there must be a vote. Yeah. And that is not how it happens in God's church. The elders should meet by consensus. Mm -hmm. So so what if you have one that's so overbearing and stubborn that that you never get anything done? Not qualified either. Like yeah. Qualified. Amen, brother. Right. He, there's a practical problem, right? Yes. He's not qualified. He's soon angry. He's soon tempered. He's a doctor. These. The truth is, what needs to happen is, is First Timothy chapter five, nineteen to twenty-one. Open your New Testament up. They don't talk about it much, but an elder is not a lifetime appointment. Right. And some of the past have felt that way. Right. I understand they have good intention, but it's an incorrect assumption. There is not any area of the Church of Christ that's a lifetime appointment. Right. I am an evangelist as long as I am faithfully teaching God's word and my life mimics the example of Jesus in every way. Mm -hmm. there, it, it is not possible for there to be lifetime appointment. That would assume, right, that would assume a false position of basically what saved always saved. Mm -hmm. So, read 1 Timothy chapter 5, 19 to 21, somebody who has it. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. I've charged you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things about prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Nothing with partiality. We all know God's not a respected person. It's right. Acts 10 and 34. James says if we make decisions based upon respected persons or partiality, we sin. Amen. There's a man coming to our assembly, and he's not dressed as fine as somebody else. We do not give him a seat that is different than somebody else. Amen. We yes. don't show partiality in the church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if we ever do do that, then we're guilty. Amen. All right. Now, the same principle from James concerning the fine raiment in the assembly, now it's going to be applied to leadership. Okay. So we have evangelist. Paul's writing to Timothy. He's an evangelist. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul said, do the work of an evangelist. So Paul was writing to an evangelist. He's giving the evangelist word and note that he's going to be with, right, he's going to be with these congregations, the presbytery. Mm -hmm. Timothy was not, but he's going to be serving alongside and under an eldership. All right, what's going to happen? Well, the Bible, because it always anticipates the future problem. Mm -hmm. It gives us direction if we would take heed to it. Yeah. What's going to happen when a younger man in his early 30s, 1 Timothy 4, 12, let no man despise thy youth. Yeah. What's going to happen when Timothy is at a congregation and something happens, and the members start coming to him. Y'all know how it is. Mm -hmm. Was a good pastor. You ever had that happen? Amen. Members come and yes. fill your ears. Yes. Yes. Oh. Amen. And, and yes. members come and say, "Well, how can so and so be them? You know, he's not qualified." And you've got different people that bring messages. Some are cantankerous, honorary people who really would not be pleased with anybody. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to understand that as an evangelist, yeah. people, right? Yeah. And then there are some, though, that are bringing an honest and honest concern. And wisdom will help you decide between the two. But the scripture tells you that here's what you must do. You can't receive the accusation unless it be founded in witness by how many? Two or two, three. Two. Yeah. And isn't that the same concept of the Old Testament? That's exactly right. Man. You're not going to stone somebody unless there's witnesses. Yes. In Matthew 18, if there's a problem with the church, we're not going... A defense, we're not going to withdraw a fellowship with somebody unless it's established. Mm -hmm. They've had opportunity to hear the case, face their offender, respond. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. God works fair, folks. Mm -hmm. These people just employ us. So here's the thing. See how when we don't follow God's word in one part practically, it bites us somewhere else. Yeah. Someone says, Well, we've got to have a lot of number of elders. Well, why? Well, because we've got somebody that, that, that's hard to get along with, and we've got to keep the numbers right. No, you need to deal with that person. If there's a true accusation that's found by multiple people, if multiple people has heard the elder, uh, you know, 
curse or, or, or just be completely outside of his temperament yes. as, a, as a Christian. And this is not an occasion once that he's repented of. This is a constant form and pattern that he develops. And multiple people know it. What's supposed to happen is either the elders through Acts chapter 20, the Bible says, take heed unto whom? Yourselves. Yourselves. Yes. And to the plot. Yeah. So the elders should shepherd themselves first. Mm -hmm. And if they cannot, then the second avenue is the evangelist is supposed to receive those accusations, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 19 through 21, and make them public before all. The evangelist is the countermeasure to the eldership, and the eldership is the countermeasure to the evangelist. Mm -hmm. Neither have full authority. You follow that? Mm -hmm. The full authority is invested in the head of the church, Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. So, when you understand that, it, it creates, it's kind of like, I mean, I hate to say kind of like, because it's not, let's just say in our country. We don't vest all power in any one area of government. Founders were very intelligent by doing so. God vests all power in the head of Jesus. But as far as the earthly construction of the organization goes, not any one man would ever be empowered in one particular congregation having sole authority. Right. In fact, when one man in the New Testament, can you think of his name? Boy. Yeah. Now, Scott, you're on it tonight. <laughs> Both knees. <laughs> Where are y'all at? <laughs> What's y'all's excuse? Right? <laughs> but that's right. Diotrephes was a deadly dictator that promoted divisiveness. And he intercepted a letter, the Bible says, prating against us with uh, evil words and malicious words, uh, that he did so with the worst of intents because he loved, the Bible says, to have the preeminence. You don't add... You don't add to the number of elders with diatrophies. Mm. You remove diatrophies. Mm -hmm. That's practical. Let's see how long we have here. Oh, we still got 30 minutes. I'm sorry. Oh, brother. I'm sorry. I mean, it's, that you talked about that a while ago. And that what hit. Everybody knows you, right? I've been there three times. Both of them are catty going to be military. This just mean, I'm sorry. My first, third favorite first scripture, James 2 and 10. A lot of other denominations, they try to justify it. James said, if you're guilty of one part of the whole law, well, you're guilty of the whole law. And he said, no justification in God's house. And I heard you preach probably, it's probably my seventh time in my small Christian your life, and you tell it like it is, you know, and that's what I love. I like a man that's turned firm on the word because it encouraged me. He said, don't grow weary and get doing It's what you do once you just tell people the truth. You don't depart of being a Christian, you know. But we're trying, I mean, and, and that's the goal is we want to factually present Christianity to the world without addition, without subtraction, but we want to do so in a temperament and department that's, that's the most, hopefully, right, accessible format. Sorry, bro. Oh, you're all right. Right. Hard to deal with. Yes. Um, in 
in 50 something years of preaching, my observation has been that it's not supposed to be that way, but there's invariably there is a head elder. I mean, whether he, he may have a lot more talent, or more uh, dedication to, to the work, but invariably he takes the lead and others follow. I don't know what, what you do with a situation like that. You know, but a good pastor makes up a good point. Now, to me, and I understand exactly what you mean as, as a minister, I've been in places where uh, I see some of that as personality, like even the apostolic band of, of disciples, right? There were various, you know, you had Peter, who was a little more impetuous, and you had John the Apostle, he loved, very emotional, and you had, you know, of course, later on, one out of due season. I mean, Paul is a very strong personality, right? Amen. Now, personalities as long as they're in check with the truth, but if it's beyond that and one elder is making decisions without the consensus of the others mm -hmm. or the general report within the church that he's overly dogmatic, now we're stepping into an area of concern, right? And so, again, wisdom kind of has to go along with that, but you're exactly right. And some people think and assume because a man is, you know, successful in life that automatically makes him uh, a good elder. And there's many who are, but not necessarily it is the case. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not necessarily the same thing. Remember that concept of brother that has that talent, people, you know, recognize that talent for making up the use of the God's glory. That's the other side of the body. Sure. But I mean, if you think about pretty much any kind of institution or club, team or whatever, you can always got some of that, you know, powerful personality. People naturally follow their, their leaders, maybe even their parents. That is, there's something about them that commands respect to people. But it has to stop at the point of there, there cannot be a misuse or misappropriation of that influence. In other words, that man must recognize the fact that he's looked up to. Mm -hmm. And if he's humble and the right man, he has to make sure that he has full consensus of, of the other elders. And he's not using those people. As puppets for us, you know, in our agenda. Amen. You're exactly right. Amen. So let's talk about when we don't, because you know, like here, and the reason we're going to talk about it because this affects you all. Amen. You know, you, you don't have elders currently. You've had them in the past. You don't have them now. And so the question is, why are some congregations without elders? Some reasons are justifiable. Some reasons are not justified. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking you to give reasons, whether it be on either side of the category, not necessarily here, just why are, what are the reasons why some do not have them? Not qualified, don't have them. Okay, Amen. some, they're simply not, there's not two men or more mm -hmm. that meet the qualification. That's true. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the reasons why many are not qualified is because of the lack of teaching and drive to get men into that, pushing them into that direction. Okay. You know, I think you almost have to start when they're this age, 15, 16, 17, telling them, you know, you need, you need to prepare yourself to be an elder one day, a Eli, preacher one day. About that? Yeah. yeah. And right. so that, that needs to be put in their mind, and they need to direct their life in that direction so when the time comes, they are qualified. Amen. Brother, brother me. And chief person, I've been to a lot of congregations that, some people, and I'm going to say it's holy because sometimes they, the Lord, say they don't want their responsibility because some of those qualified are lazy. He said, do not be slow for in the business. You know what I'm saying? I can't be one because I'm not married. Never been married. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So I, didn't make it, so I was qualified, but I'm not married. You see? And I've seen some congregation I've been to, you got people just qualified. And you know, I've been ex mentioned Eric been a mention, this young man right here, and you. Some people are qualified, but they come, I ask them, we put a bit, like, why don't you be the other two? Well, I mean, I don't want that responsibility, because it is a lot of responsibility yes, to be an we, elder. We hear that. Some men simply do not want the task, the responsibility, yes. the burden yes. of being a deacon, an evangelist, uh, an elder, and so forth. But, but we've got, as Eric mentioned, we need from the pulpits enthusiastic passion and drive, mm -hmm. Bible-centered teaching that hopefully creates an atmosphere in every local church where men start desiring. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, they think, desire. Yeah. You, got, you, know, you know what it takes to get to heaven? I mean, yes, we have to obey God. 
but you have to have desire. Yeah. Because obedience, rope obedience without desire, it, it is not going to cut it. So you have to have a passion for God, a desire for God. And when you have that strong desire and you start learning His will and you, you have that faith that develops in the Word of God, that faith is going to reach out in obedience to God. Man. And so you're right. We've got to develop and foster an environment that's conducive for desire. Mm. Could you imagine someday you're older in years and to find out your sons have decided, or even your daughters, daughters will be wives of elders, or, or your sons that they, they're, they're going to be put forth for the congregation to be an elder in the Lord's church? Mm. What an honor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean uh, in the sense of, of uh, loftiness. I'm talking about the fact that they have lived their life and they've chosen to serve God in that capacity. Mm -hmm. There would be nothing. That would make me more excited and, and it was in, within my heart than for one of my sons to become an elder Lord's church. Mm -hmm. Even beyond preaching. Mm -hmm. A lot of men qualify to preach. Yes. But you know, an elder really takes a lifetime of yeah. work. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many mistakes that you can make between the between the time you get to an elder to, to the point where you can be an elder to all the life that you've lived prior to that. So many mistakes you can make, so that's why it's so important. That um, that you know you, you you start on the right track yeah. in an early stage in life. Amen. The domestic qualification. Amen. Right? The, the way in which we live our lives and our business and the way in which we treat our fellow man, our our faithfulness to the New Testament church, and, and just all of those things. Amen. So I also want to look at this. One of the things that I want to discuss tonight in redigging the wells is the way in which congregations handle the money. Now we know here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, we know that the money is to be utilized in a way that promotes evangelism and benevolence and, and, and used in a proper way. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm being more specific than that tonight. I, I'm talking about, and I know you know the emphasis upon <laughs> giving, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, on the first day of the week and all those things. <laughs> but in many places, as a traveling evangelist, I have heard many people concerned for the years. And you know, many people's concerns could be eliminated by doing things the right way. And that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, we have a large fight on our hands with the world, with Satan, right? Mm -hmm. And it's cars. Mm -hmm. We go out and battle that. I love coming to the house of the Lord, that is the assembly. I Man. love coming here. You yes. know why? Because mm -hmm. it's a shelter for a temporary while. Mm -hmm. Amen. It, 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 it's yes. a refuge. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we get built back up, and then we go back in the world and fight again, and, and, and you know, and, and hold what's right, and get beaten down sometimes, ridiculed, and then we come back here, and we're built back up. I, I really enjoy coming here. Mm -hmm. it, it's a blessing. So we need not... Leadership needs to be trained, and, and whether we have elders and deacons, as the ideal is, or whether we have men's meetings, which is, by implication, the next best thing that we could possibly do, those men need to be faithful, by the way. But when we have those men's business meetings, here's one thing we need to do. We need to make sure the entire congregation has access to transparency of the funds of the church. Right. Amen. Yes. Y'all know with me? Yeah. Now, you, you tell me as a member tonight, I want to hear from you. Why as a member is this important to you? method, right? <laughs> the secret method. And what it does, it causes a lot of 
of unnecessary undercurrents of talk and speculative yeah. thoughts. It does, yeah. correct? Or you can turn it into a plus and say, because of your offerings, here's what the congregation is able to do to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. and, and you list those out. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps things transparent. It's that Brother Bernard really said basically what I'm saying. And it shows, too, that it shows people about the growth of the church and that gift. You see, you see that when well, the money's done. Because some people that work hard for the money, old congregation, we had this problem I went through for eight years. Nobody never got no financial report, which I knew, because I was no that. I got flaws. So I know the around in the mirror, so I'm sitting, but I mean, and then we told them one night, then they start doing it one day, because she won't know where her hard work and money is going, and make sure that his brother Burr said it is distributed right, you know, because some places yeah. I've seen that people right. take money, they was robbing, they use it for their personal gain instead of Christ, you know, and that and that's right. mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses yes. 1 and 2, the false yes. teachers, right, right, making gain or merchandise. So mm -hmm. the question is, why is it important for the transparency of the funds in every local congregation to be prevalent? And I mentioned about turning it to a plus. Mm -hmm. You can either conceal it and have the speculative reasoning and the undercurrents of gossip, or you can take away that temptation, make it transparent, and it promotes growth yes. because people are able to see that they're a small part of a larger work than us all. Mm -hmm. the work of the Lord. And, a and husband, it's an encouragement. A husband and wife does it. The husband's not the only one that gives. The yes. wife is giving too. Amen. Amen. So mm -hmm. therefore they got just as much right or yes. however you want to say it to see how it's being used. Yes. Just because I may be the head of the household that doesn't mean that Daddy and I both are not giving. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And every one of you, you're contributing to that. That's a great point. So let's look, for example, Acts 11, verse 30. Acts 11, verse 30. And let's have somebody read that passage. I want to show you that even under times when you had apostles and elders, the first century church, great men of God, that there was a transparency and a mechanism that always is had in the New Testament. And if God set this pattern in the New Testament, we ought to follow it. Acts 11 30. The Bible says, Which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They sent the money, notice this, to an eldership. I have a question. Why would they send it to an eldership? If one congregation is sending money, they've taken up money for the needy saints, and they're sending it, why are they going to take it to the hands of the elders? Or to the elders, excuse me. But why the elders? Because they're the ones who bought it. Man. Yeah, the overseers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, who better to send it to? Not one preacher. Y'all see this? Mm -hmm. They're going to send it to the presbyteros. Mm -hmm. That multiple body of men that are qualified. They're not real young, right? Mm -hmm. the overly they're older, seasoned men. And by the way, the Bible says the elder, not only is not a novice, but he cannot be greedy or filthy. The cure. The cure. The cure. Yes, sir. So he's been checked out. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, he's passed that youthfulness. Mm -hmm. He's showed in display over the seasonality of his life that he's not given to the underhandedness of filthy lucre. Right. So they're not going to send it to one elder, though. They're going to send it to the body of men, those elders. All right? So who's going to take the fund in Acts 11.30 to the other congregation and give it to the elders? Who's going to take it? Barnabas and Saul. Two. Brother Luke, Pastor Crick. Isn't that powerful? Uh-huh. Yeah. Sometimes we don't see the, the details of Scripture. Mm -hmm. God has already given us a pattern. If we follow it, it stops the undercurrent. Right. There's no way for it to go wrong if we follow God's teachings. It's when we don't subscribe to these things that we get ourselves into trouble. The treasurer might ask, well, they don't trust me? Not a matter of trust. Do you trust God? Mm -hmm. Trust God. See, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of transparency. Paul said, do things honorable in the sight of all men. Some churches I've worked with had two people to sign a check. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Excellent idea. It just, the old, you've heard the old saying, it keeps the honest. 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 Mm -hmm. So a lot of good reasons anymore. What are the reasons as members that, that you appreciate the transparency? Anybody? Well, 
involved with the men in certain meetings, and then the men take it when the yes. elders take the information from that meeting with the men, and then they decide on those matters for the option. Yes. But likewise, if the whole congregation would have, we all realize we have three, five hundred people that can be a little smaller congregation to have congregational meetings to keep everybody informed as to what's going on in the congregation and how it is. Everybody likes communication. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. I don't know how to ask that. I was, don't do it. That was my youthful, uh, youthful foolishness coming out. That's why I can't be an elder right now. I was going to ask every lady that feels like she doesn't have enough communication, raise your hand. That, 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 that's not good. Forget that. Forget that. But, but seriously, every marriage as one of the largest components is communication. There was times in my marriage I did not communicate really as effectively as I should have. And every time I found out about that. Right? <laughs> so, see, there has to be a system of value in the church. Members need to understand that they're valued. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that leadership shows value to the members is by the transparency of everything. Mm -hmm. And when we know that we are truly a family and that we're in this together, yes, we have leaders. And I may never be qualified to be them. That's okay. Right? I'm, I'm going to be the part that I can be. Man. But I'm still held in value in the local congregation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm informed of what's going on. And there's a communication. And when that's present, that itself will help lift the church. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it brings us all to be like mine. <laughs> yes. Yes. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. That's exactly right. Let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I first started preaching. My first full time. I mean, I preached other places, but I'm my first full time work. And he's passed away now. He was a great man. But on this point, I disagreed. And he said, uh, the tailor was saying, he said, well, I, we don't want to tell the people how much you're making. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, a lot of people here don't make as much as you. Well, that's true. There were some retired people. Of course, I'm raising a family. You know, <laughs> and I said, well, Brother Taylor, here's how I look at it. If, if you're so embarrassed that, it's, that it's, 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 too, you know, it's too high that you need to cut it down a little bit. Amen. If you're so embarrassed that it's too little, when they find out that what you're paying, they're going to be upset. They need to raise it up a little bit. But in either way, they need to be told because the people support the work of the church. Mm -hmm. right. And finally, we did that. And we never had a problem with it. When you don't relate things like that, people imagine. Yes. People speculate. And oftentimes, they will form something in their mind that is beyond really what it actually is. Mm -hmm. The best way it is is to deliver the truth yes. Yes. and be transparent. And let's also look at this point. How to conduct. I thought about writing a tract on this. Never, I've never personally seen one. <clears throat> With all these seminars on elders and deacons, right? Have you ever heard of a seminar on men's meetings? Mm -mm. You know, more, more churches of Christ have men's meetings than elders and deacons now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most churches of Christ in Clay County probably do not have elders. Because they're smaller. All right, now, think about it. So while we want to push for the ideal elders and deacons, train the next generation, create an atmosphere <coughs> of desire and push for that, until that time, now we have to learn how to function properly mm -hmm. and carry on the work of the church until that time. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? I was going to say, uh, the Gainsborough congregation, several years ago, for a few years before we went, they did have leadership development mm -hmm. on Saturday. Okay, good. But, but, but you see, my point is so many are struggling, and so here's just some practical points. I mean, throw them out there. What are some practical points concerning the men's meetings of the congregation? Well, I think, I think there needs to be a certain level of maturity, and let's let the boys be boys. And let the men be men and make decisions. Okay. You know, in other words, you know, you got somebody that, that's young and immature. Um, I, I don't think that they're wise enough to be making decisions on like whether or not we're going to fire you, or Amen. you know, I mean, uh, you're going to you're going to small town in South. We'll call it out. Somebody watching this later on. <laughs> <laughs> I forget we're live. <laughs> <In> Southwest Oklahoma. <laughs> The true story where I had been filling in. A preacher there had been hospitalized. 
And, and truthfully, he probably wasn't the best orator. He probably would not have been hired by any large congregation. But for where he was in life, he did the best he could. And truthfully, they were not anywhere near a large congregation. So they have to also realize their limits. Mm -hmm. But here he's in the hospital, and some had not liked him anyways. They gather up a real quick little men's meeting. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know how it went. It went south from there. They took what they should not have taken. What was that? A vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. They had people come to the meeting that were either one, out of duty, mm -hmm. two, very young in age, but technically had, quote, been baptized, that were not even able to go to war for their country they were so young. <laughs> yeah. But here they are sitting in a room, and they're going to bring in this group and terminate this guy. You now, you see how messy this is? Yes. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, let us not point any fingers toward the organization of other religious groups until we first take care of our own. That's right. That's not correct. Yeah. In the absence of elders and deacons, we're talking about the faithful men yes. of the congregation. And by the way, there has to be shepherding, and there has to be advancement, and there has to be decision making until we have elders and deacons. Mm -hmm. And so those faithful men, men, must be there to make those decisions. I'm sorry about the stuff to feel. Yes, sir. As we said about that too, Eric said, I think this is me personally. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's been a recovering addict say, you know, true yes, to sir. itself. The truth goes, it's been a Christian to me only, I don't know about you, is that the humility part. You know what I'm saying? You got to be humble when you tell the truth. And as you said, you got to know every detail. There's so much hearsay gone. He said, what I go for lack of study. To me, when you hearsay, I use you, for example, you don't get mad, but somebody says, well, but stuff is rotten to come to the church. If I ain't got no evidence of right. you not running the congregation, I'm going to correct nobody to see. That ain't nothing but Matthew 7 and 1. You judge, judge you not, but you shall be known. If I know about it, I ask you, how many brother, you know this is a right. This is a sin in God's eye. You yeah, know, it's unrighteous judgment. Right. Because it's not based on fact. And you, right. you're, you're correct. We hear so many things. Yes. And until it's proven, it should be just that, right. hearsay. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in the court of law, do you want somebody standing up and giving hearsay testimony concerning your physical life? No. They don't stand up in the court of law. See, hearsay is good. <laughs> right. Hearsay is real fun to hear and yeah. to discuss until it affects who? You. You. Yourself. Until it affects me. Mm -hmm. right. So that's a good point you made. Oh. Kenny says he's made a righteous judgment. It's time to, <laughs> it's time to stop. Good to see everyone. Uh, speak and be friendly. We'll be back here in five minutes. Yes.